Well, thank you for joining us, Dr. Zareski. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, I suppose so. <laughs> I've been around for quite a while. I have been studying and teaching argumentation and related areas for about 50 years. I'm now officially retired and have been for, for some time, but I continue to be active. I got involved in it originally through participation in high school and college debate. Uh, so for me, like a number of other people, it was practice that preceded theory. And uh, over time, I discovered that there was an academic field here that governed how disputes were conducted and resolved and uh, how they ought to be and how, they, how uh, life could be improved if they were. And uh, my, my interest just never flagged. It's continued across all that time. Yeah, and where, uh, how did you come to study argumentation? I took an undergraduate class in the mid 60s, which was about the time the field was beginning to make a transition from an academic curriculum that was essentially how to debate, yeah. it was practice oriented and narrowly confined uh, to an academic curriculum that was theory grounded. And so for example, I read Toulmin's Uses of Argument just a few years after it had come out and related work and began just to get more and more interested in argumentation, not in, its, not in its specific application to the debate setting, but in its more general role as a means of decision making. That's interesting. So this was right about 1950, like 1958, right, is when Toulmin came out and the New Rhetoric and... It, the the New Rhetoric of... came out in French in 58. It wasn't translated into English until the late 60s. Until the late 60s, okay. And I'm talking about my first encounter with argumentation theory was about 65. 65? 1965. What was, out of curiosity, was it was Toulmin your first, uh, your first love in argumentation theory, your first interaction? I don't think so. Um, we began by reading some of the old, older debate textbooks, but thinking of them in a wider uh, context, like Glenn Mills' Reason in Controversy. Yeah. Uh, this was also about the time that Johnstone and Nathanson I love that stuff. From Penn State were doing their work together, and I, I remember reading Philosophy, Rhetoric, and Argumentation. Yeah. Uh, and I did read Toulmin. Uh, I don't know that I was particularly attracted to Toulmin, except uh, I liked his challenge to the assumption that formal deduction was the model for logic and reasoning, and some of the limitations that uh, he talked about about regarding that as a model. Yeah. Yeah, to, to put this into some context for people who might not be uh, generally aware, uh, argumentation before really the, the 60s was mostly understood as formal logic, right? Right. And, right. and in, informal reasoning attempted to model itself on formal logic. Yeah. Formal logic was the gold standard. And what Toulmin is arguing is, look, Formal logic is one specialized application of reasoning. There's no point to think of it as the gold standard because then by definition, all these other forms of reasoning will not meet it. Right, yeah, I mean like who honestly is perfectly rational uh, in, in everyday life, right? Well, you can't be. Yeah. Uh, because you know, in, in everyday life, you're always having to make these jumps between facts and values uh, between, in the classic sense, is statements and ought statements. And these are gaps that by formal logic can't be bridged. Yeah. Well, in language, right, are, is too polysemous to ever be a stable, like math, at least, the number is stable, right? But language sure. has so many meanings, it can never sure. uh, provide the same stability. So, you, uh, where did you study? Where did I what? Where did you study? Oh, at Northwestern. At Northwestern. Uh, my entire academic career so far, uh, with the exception of a couple of visiting appointments, has been at, at Northwestern. 
Do you have Northwestern tattooed somewhere, everywhere? Uh, no, but I have a lot of shirts and stuff with it on. <laughs> and who, who did you study with? Who was your advisor? Uh, working on my doctorate, my advisor was Leland Griffin. Okay, of okay. social movement fame? Yes. Okay, awesome. And so the, the million dollar question, what do you think argumentation offers society? I think it offers a way to make reason guided decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Can you unpack that a little bit? Soci social life is characterized by uncertainty. We don't know about the future. We don't know the consequences of our actions. We don't know for sure about uh, what is good or right or beautiful or any other sort of values. Uh, we don't know which of two competing expert claims is the right one. And yet on all of these things, we have to make decisions and we have to make them usually with time constraints and with that inadequate information. And so the question is, are we going to make them whimsically, capriciously, or are we going to make them guided by some kind of uh, principles or procedures? And I think argumentation supplies that set of principles and procedures. Yeah, whimsy does sound like a fun way to make decisions, but it doesn't sound well, like a sustainable way. So there, there are aspects of our lives for which that's exactly uh, perfectly fine and appropriate. Yeah. But there are others for which it's not. <laughs> yeah. System of governance, for, for example. For example. Yeah. Right. So you think that the sort of the study of argumentation offers society a way to start thinking about how we can make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. Yes. And, and, and justify those decisions to others. And justify those decisions to others. What would you call your approach to argumentation? Does it have a label if we're trying to like, if we're taking a step back and thinking about all the different ways we would look at the study of argument and the different perspectives? Well, I'm as imperialistic as the next person, so I just call it argumentation. <laughs> but if, if I had to characterize it, I would characterize it as a rhetorical approach to argumentation because it's fundamentally grounded in a consideration of audience. Okay. Whether, whether the audience is the other person that you're arguing with, as it sometimes is, especially informally, or whether the audience is a, a forum that's convened for that purpose, a third party that competitors argue for the judgment of the third party, or whether it's a general public, a broad uh, mass audience. It's ultimately, it's ultimately the audience that determines uh, whether an argument's justified or not, or which of two competing positions is going to be uh, accepted or acceptable. Now that doesn't mean that one just panders to the audience and anything that can persuade an audience, whether it's threats or bribery or whatever counts as argument. I mean, the assumption is that, that the audience is exercising its critical thinking abilities that are uh, inherent in human beings. Yeah. So you would identify as a rhetorical argumentation scholar, and that's always oriented towards an audience, right? And I think that there's a couple interesting things you said in there. One is that you recognize the agency of the audience, but you sort of also identified a couple different kinds of audiences in there. Can you tell me a right. little bit more about that? You said a public audience. I heard maybe gestures towards a universal audience in there too. Well, I mean, I think there are all different levels of audience. There are all different sit kinds of situations in which audiences uh, participate. Yeah. So I guess, I guess at the, at the smallest level, you can have an argument with yourself where you know, you're in effect role playing two different sides of an issue or two different people. Yeah. Uh, more, more, much more common than that is interpersonal or dyadic argument, which is argument between two people in which the arguers and the evaluators of the argument are the same. Uh, so if I'm having that kind of an argument with you, we have different points of view about something and the object is to come to some common understanding. 
whether it's by my convincing you, you're convincing me, or we reach some third conclusion that neither one of us started out with. Yeah. It's argumentation within small groups where you know one person may be making a, a case that a group of six or seven or eight people is going to evaluate. Uh, there are arguments in the adjudication kind of setting where a mediator or an arbitrator or a judge or a jury represents the third party that two competing arguers uh, try to get the judgment of. Uh, there's a, a mass audience, uh, an audience in which one, one person is trying to sway the, the judgment of a very large group. Uh, much political argument is like that, for example. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the universal audience. That's, that's of course, a term that comes from Chaim Perlman uh, in the new rhetoric. Uh, and he fortunately or otherwise didn't define it too precisely uh, in the same way that Toulmin didn't define argument field too precisely. Yeah. But my, my understanding of the universal audience has always been that it's, it's not an actual audience of any kind. It's a construct that exists in the mind of the arguer, of the audience that uh, is unswayed by prejudice or self-interest or uh, personal considerations or anything other than the merit of the argument. And that's the ideal kind of audience that you would imagine yourself appealing to at the same time that you are in fact appealing to an actual present audience. Okay, so it's like something that helps you sort of invent reasons when you're thinking how you're going to persuade people. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So what is an argument? That's a deceptively simple question. <laughs> you know, because they're, they're, they're a group of interrelated terms. There's arguing, argument argumentation, and they all refer sort of to the same thing, but with different kind of emphasis. So I would say an argument is a structure of a claim that's made on the audience's beliefs, reasons that are offered for it, and a usually implicit inference that suggests why those reasons ought to count as reasons for the claim that's being made. Now. That, that kind of definition says that an argument is a thing, it's a product, but it's produced as a result of the process of arguing, of making claims, defending them with reasons, and suggesting why they ought to count as reasons. And argumentation, I think of as a, as a term that describes this whole process of justifying claims under conditions of uncertainty. Yeah. Okay, so the one, and that would be more of a process. So if the first one is a product, right. the other definition would be more of a process. Right. And I also think of argumentation as a point of view, as a particular way to look at uh, discourse. That's Can you tell us more about that? Thing. Right. It's, it's also that. Uh, so, for example, you know, let's take the, the discourse at a protest rally. Yeah does not have to be understood as argument, but it can be. And to the degree that it is, then argumentation is a point of view with which you look at this discourse that you can also look at in other ways. Yeah. So I, I, I see it as product, process, and point of view. And point of view, interesting. Um, so how do you identify when an argument has occurred? Well, it occurs in the mind of the beholder. Okay. Uh, you know, so if I think of something that's taken place, some interchange that's taken place as an argument, then as far as I'm concerned, an argument has occurred. And yeah. if, I can, if I can examine it by saying, you know, here's the claim or claims that's being made on people's belief, here's how the claim is being justified and there's an inference that connects the two, then I've got an argument. Right. Someone else might not see it as an argument. Right. 
So there's a degree of subjectivity involved or subjectiveness to identifying arguments. Yes, but in fact, it's as much inner subjectiveness. Tell me more. Well, you know, when I say if I see it, it's, it's an argument. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not entirely right. I mean, you know, that could mean I'm just idiosyncratic and crazy and so on. It's, it's my ability to explain what's taken place as an argument to other people that are willing to entertain the possibility that it, there might be an argument. That's really the consideration. So it's, it's intersubjective agreement on the criteria, not yeah. just an individual's um, idiosyncratic way to see it. Yeah, well, if you, I, I'm just thinking of like an ordinary example around the house. If you and your partner are having a disagreement about who should do the dishes, if your partner doesn't acknowledge that you are disagreeing and they walk away, you might not be having an argument. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. And the same might be thought of methodologically for the argumentation critic is that the same sort of sense of where an argument might be, this sort of intuition is still there with us, is sort of what you're right. saying. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah, of course, there, there are sometimes stakes in seeing something as an argument or not as an argument. Yeah. Tell me more. Well, I mean, take your example about this disagreement about doing the dishes. Yeah. You know, if one if one party sees what's going on as a rant, then there are certain privileges and responsibilities that follow from that. Yeah. Uh, for instance, that, that party should feel under no obligation to present reasons for his or her point of view if the other party is just going off on a rant. Right. So to, rec to recognize something as an argument is to entail a certain kind of way of looking at it and certain obligations of behavior. Yeah, this is getting at one of the things that I found really interesting through many of these interviews is the speech act or the, the sort of standpoint has come up a lot that when one makes an argument, sort of an implicit definition that keeps coming up a lot is that it also implies a series of obligations. So it's not just that there is a premise or a, a reason right that comes up in an inference but also a duty associated with it to defend or retract it or otherwise yes. just a rant yes yes um and i, I like this idea of stakes right because the, it i think argument is fundamentally social what you were saying a moment ago it's intersubjective right so you're risking a face that's right yeah i mean you're you're risking the, the possibility that you may be proved wrong, which is uncomfortable in itself, and you're risking loss of face as a consequence of that, which is uncomfortable in itself. Yeah. So why would you ever engage in those risks? Because you believe in the value of gaining the other person's agreement through reason means rather than arbitrarily or by force. Yeah. No, it's true. Now, I, for me, I guess this raises the question. So we're looking at a text, you and I, you've identified an argument. How do you go about, because I think part of it is that argumentation, uh, especially rhetorical argumentation is often enthymematic. And for those who don't know what that means, that's, it's implied, right? You don't go around expressing all of an argument. Much of it happens in the subtext. So how do well, you, and you, what assume, do? you assume certain premises on the part of the audience to start with yeah. as a result of either what you know about the specific audience or about uh, common general understandings of things uh, and, and so on. So there's, there's not the necessity to state explicitly what you can count on implicitly coming from the audience. Right. And that's, that's the sense in which arguments are co-created, particularly looking at arguments rhetorically, they're co-created by the arguers and the audience. Right. But for the critic, for like students going about um, looking for arguments in texts, right? So they might go and get op-eds 
how would you suggest starting to look or reconstruct or? Well, let me take a specific example before I answer your question more generally. Mm -hmm. We're having this conversation on the eve of the 4th of July. Yeah. When I taught argumentation, one of the things that I would often do is give students a copy of the Declaration of Independence and say, what's the What's the argument here? Now, most people don't intuitively think of the Declaration of Independence as an argument, but that's precisely what it is. It was written for that very purpose, to sway particular audiences that can be identified uh, that were apathetic or somewhat hostile to the cause of independence to embrace it. And you can follow through the structure of the Declaration and if I say what's going on here, it's pretty clear the Declaration does three things, and it does them in this order. It establishes in principle the right to revolution. It portrays a long train of abuses on the part of King George III, leading to the conclusion that revolution is justified, and it details a lot of unsuccessful attempts to gain redress of those grievances, leading to the conclusion that it's a reluctant revolution, but necessary. So you put all that together and it makes a case for revolution. Now, interestingly, one of the things that the authors of the Declaration did not do is they did not attack monarchy in principle. This long chain of abuses are attributed specifically to the monarch of, of England. Yeah. This is in contrast to common sense, Thomas Paine's uh, document that had come out about six months earlier. So you ask the question, well, why? And the answer, if you know, if you know a little bit about the historical context, the answer comes pretty quickly to mind. The uh, leaders of the revolution are hopeful of getting assistance from France. In fact, they need assistance from France in order to have any chance of prevailing in the war that's already underway. Well, France, the French Revolution hasn't happened yet. France is ruled by a monarchy. So if you attack monarchy in principle, like Thomas Paine did, how likely are you going to be to get the consent of that audience that this is a reasonable position? Right. So instead of, instead of making uh, arguments about monarchy, you make arguments about the King of England. Well, I'm illustrating a way to take a text and say, well, what, what are the claims here? How are they put together? Why are they put together this way? What inferences are, are dependent upon? Do these strike you as sound or unsound, good or bad? And that's sort of the process that I think one goes through in examining a text, whether the text is an op-ed uh, or an editorial or a letter to the editor uh, or anything like that. Well, one, of now, the one, one caveat yeah. is in doing that, you've also got to make some judgment about whether the argument is being made seriously or whether this is a satire or parody or tongue in cheek, because sometimes people will make arguments to suggest the opposite conclusion by the extreme to which the argument takes its positions. So you have to factor that in as well. Yeah, like uh, a modest proposal, perhaps. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that you need to consider a couple things: the text, but also who's the text addressed to, what audiences, and maybe who's not addressed. Right. Right. And what's um, the contextual situation in which all this is happening? Yeah, I think that's really good advice, and that we can't just look at the the object in and of itself when we're looking at how we're going to piece all this together. Right. Let me give you one other example that I would often use in my, in my class. Yeah. When Barack Obama was running for president the first time, one of the leaders of the Federalist Society, which is a conservative organization that, among other things, evaluates judicial candidates, put out a, a broadside saying that Obama was too young to be president. And the argument went something like this. Uh, granted, he's over the age of 35, but 
with increased longevity these days, 55 is the new 35. And if you look at the people that were elected president under the age of 55, uh, they made this mistake and this mistake and this mistake and this mistake. And, you know, therefore Obama's too young to be president. Now, students usually had trouble with this because they, they saw it as an idiotic position until I got them around to thinking that the real claim that is being defended here is not that Obama is too young to be president. The real claim that's being defended here is that the Constitution ought to be interpreted literally. And it literally says 35, so it means 35. And if you start interpreting the text of the Constitution in the light of contemporary reality, then by the same sort of inference pattern, you get to these statements that the age really ought to be thought of as 55. Interesting. So that's, you know, that, that's an example of how, in order to get the sense of that argument, in order to get the sense of that argument, you have to understand who the Federalist Society is and what their positions are. Yeah, that's interesting. 55. Wow. I, just sort of as you're telling me that I struck, I could be run for president and that would be terrifying. I do not feel old enough to be president. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Ugh. That's a really good example. So now that you've sort of identified and analyzed an argument, how do you determine if an what constitutes a good argument? Well, there, there are sort of several levels at which you could do that. I mean, there's the gut check sense. Uh, you know, does this sound like it's off the wall or does it sound like it's got some credibility to it? Uh, most people reacted to that Federalist Society thing with a gut, che gut check sense. This is nonsense. <laughs> yeah. You know, without going further than that and to try to figure out what it's actually saying. But I think beyond that, there are various tests that you can apply. And the, the informal logic movement in Canada particularly has done a very good job of taking a number of things that are traditionally seen as fallacies, as invalid reasoning, and saying, well, now look, in some circumstances, these may be perfectly valid, and in other circumstances, they're clearly not. So what do you have to ask yourself about it? And the, the questions that they come up with are different for different patterns of, of reason. But all of those tests are ultimately based in experience, that satisfying those tests over the long haul generally results in conclusions that you can trust or generally results in conclusions that you can't trust. Yeah, I like that. So you find yourself like one of the things that uh, the Canadians do or the informal logicians is like the RSA triangle, the relevant sufficiency and acceptability triangle. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, I think that's a perfectly good example, yeah. Or I know they're doing some stuff with um, artificial intelligence, although I don't know what. Yes, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of different uh, sort of subsets of argumentation scholars working with artificial intelligence. I'm not one of them. Yeah, neither am I. That's one area I'm ignorant. You know, but, but for example, uh, some of the work on argument diagramming or argument mapping is drawing on artificial intelligence. And I, I think that's a very promising line of work, and it's uh, suggesting some very interesting kinds of things, but it's not what I do. Yeah. So can you give us uh, a contemporary example that illustrates your approach to argumentation? Uh, sure. What could be more contemporary than this morning's newspaper? In this morning, this is the 2nd of July in uh, 2020. In Making sure morning, I'm not going to make any of this evergreen. <laughs> in this morning's New York Times, there is a full page ad that says that Yale University should be renamed. I did not see that. And this follows a push in recent weeks to rename, or to rename or remove Confederate monuments or prominent examples of defense of white supremacy or racism, 
and makes the argument that uh, the benefactor of Yale was a slave trader in India centuries ago. And therefore, by the same reasoning that Yale recently chose to rename one of its residential colleges that, that had been named after Calhoun, or that Princeton recently decided to rename the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, Yale should rename itself. And uh, the author of this full page ad proposed that it should rename itself after one of the first American, uh, uh, one of the first African Americans who was a, a student at Yale, whose last name happened to be Dummer, D-U-M-M-E-R. And so the proposal of this ad is that Yale should rename itself Dummer University and uh, all these different things should be Dummer so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Now this is a facetious ad. I mean, it's exactly like the Federalist Society one that I talked about. Yeah. But what it's trying to do is it's trying to use the technique that's called reductio ad absurdum. So it takes the claim that's being made sincerely that this, that, or the other should be renamed and carries it to its logical or illogical conclusion. Well, how can you tell what's the claim that's being made here and what's the real claim behind the ad, which is that the renaming movement is itself dumber, spelled differently, yeah. um, other than to say there's an argument going on here and this is an intervention in a dispute that's taking place in contemporary society. And if it achieves what I think is the purpose of its author, it will cause audiences to say, now, wait a minute, have we really gone in the right direction with all this move to rename based on a singular aspect of a person's history or personality? But it also could have the result of accelerating uh, that same phenomenon by people who take that same text and see it as an argument the other way, and see it as an argument that's being made seriously in favor of this kind of, of action or attitude. Yeah, well, there's not always the risk of satire. Right, now, that may not be the best example, but it's the most contemporary example that I can find. No, that's super interesting. Well, as an object of, of criticism too, it's just, fast. it's an ad, which also is interesting, right? And the way right. that part of it can be taken up too. Right, that's so right. big money is behind it, making this argument speech money. That is fascinating. I did not see that today. Um, quarantine life. Wow, that's great. Well, um, do you have any other bits of advice that you would like to pass along to uh, up and coming argumentation scholars or critics? Well, I try not to give unsolicited advice about anything, but uh, I, I guess what I would say is uh, not that there's a big risk of this right now, but don't lust after what was once seen as the holy grail of formal logic. That is, you know, argumentation is not a precise subject. It's not a science. It's, uh, it involves interpretation and judgment. Uh, people will see different things as fallacies. And they'll see different things as good arguments. Uh, and that's, that reflects the messiness of the actual social reality in which the arg in which argumentation takes place. Yeah, I like that. I think that's a good place to end is that argument is not precise. It's messy, just like the democracy it, com it comes from, right? Right, right, yeah. absolutely. All right, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, Dr. Zarowski. Oh, you're very welcome, it was a pleasure. All right, cheers.